Hey, Vantage Point Church, this is Chris Causey, and I am so honored to be with you today. I am such a huge fan of your church and especially your pastor and his family. Um, I'm actually, while I'm the lead pastor of Encounter Church in Boston area, I'm actually more proud of the other title that I hold, which is the president of the Mark Lee Fan Club, because your pastor is probably one of the um, friendliest, most engaging, funniest, gifted communicators, and he happens to be the fastest pastor in America. So super excited about him being here later in the year, hopefully running his fastest Boston Marathon. So thank you so much for allowing me to be a part of the Vantage Point Church family, and I can't wait to share what God has for us today. Today I want to talk about how to be brave. In 2015, a Sydney Police Department got a series of phone calls where they were hearing complaints and concerns from neighbors of a certain apartment where sounds of furniture being thrown, a woman screaming, the, a voice saying, I'm going to kill you, this really intense kind of um, altercation. And so the police arrive on scene and they pound on the door and a man, according to the police report, comes to the door. He's a little winded, he's red, he's out of breath and a little flustered, and the policeman says, where's your wife? And the man's like, I, I don't have one. He's like, where's your girlfriend then? He's I, I, I don't have one of those either. And the police let him know, like, look, buddy, we've, we've gotten the phone calls. We've heard about the loud, the loud thumps and the thundering noises of things bouncing off the wall, and we've heard the reports of a woman screaming and a voice saying, I'm going to kill you. So Come clean, mate. What have you done with her? And the guy kind of looks down and sheepishly starts to back up. And they say, well, mate. And he's like, uh, it, was, it was a spider. What? There was a really big spider. Well, what about the woman screaming, mate? Said, that was me. <laughs> you see, he um, had encountered a really, really large spider in his apartment. In the process, he kind of freaked out, began to throw furniture at it, screaming, running around. And just in case you're kind of tempted to want to judge this poor guy, you need to know that in Australia, the spiders down under are huge might. They can be about this big. This is life size. Actually, not really. If this thing ever came into my apartment, though, I would totally sign my lease over. I would not even ask questions, hand the keys, walk away. But this spider is actually one of the varieties of spiders that you can find, and it's about a foot long. So this spider in real life is about a foot long. And so maybe you and I don't know what it's like to have the police called on our fears, like this poor guy did. But the reality is, is that we all know what it's like to be stuck in a prison of fear. Whether it's been this past year with walking through a global pandemic or maybe it's been tied to some issues around that, whether it's your finances or whether it's an area of relationships that have been kind of going through this tension. And for all of us, we want to make sure that we don't just live in the prison of fear, but coming out of this pandemic, how do we make sure that we break free and discover how to be brave? And today I want to take you to a story written, a moment, an account written by one of the biographers of the life of Jesus named Matthew. And in this account, we actually see a pathway and some principles to help us break free from the prison of fear that we can find ourselves living in. Matthew, what's important to know about him is that he was an, essentially a Roman IRS tax agent who began to follow Jesus and left all of that behind. But like any good tax agent, Matthew had an attention to detail. And Matthew's audience was primarily Jewish. And those details become really important when we dive into the passage we're going to look at today. Because hidden underneath the surface of the language we're reading in is the language that Matthew wrote it in in, the, in his day. And those details are going to help to bring to life this story we're going to look at today that can help you and I discover how we can be brave. 
So we're going to jump in Matthew chapter 14, verse 22. It says, immediately he, being Jesus, made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he sent the crowds away. So Jesus has sent his 12 disciples, this group of followers, into the boat. Matthew is one of them. And so Matthew is about to give us an eyewitness account, a play-by-play to everything we're about to see in Matthew chapter 14. So jumping a couple verses, we see that they're in the boat, and now the boat has already gone a long distance from the land. Now, Matthew doesn't write long distance. He actually, being very detailed, writes the exact amount of distance. that They've gone roughly 30 stadia, which is about 3.41 miles, which is about half of the distance across the Sea of Galilee where their boat currently is. He also lets us know that they've gone all of that long distance, and while they've been going that way, what's actually been happening is they've been battered by the waves For the wind was contrary. Essentially, they are in an intense storm. And he gives us this detail. He says, and in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. He lets us know that not only have they gone 3.4 miles, they've also been traveling for about nine hours so far. So if you do the quick math, that's roughly 0.37 miles per hour, which is about the speed of a tortoise. So you can imagine a group of men who are rowing and straining and pushing. The wind is not helping them. It's contrary, which means that the sail on the sailboat's not helpful. So they're all pushing and rowing. They're in a boat that's got about four foot sides. And so as they're rowing and pushing and straining physically against the storm, the storm is so strong that they're barely making any progress. Now, they haven't slept in a while, so they're exhausted. It's almost 24 hours since they've last slept, so they're physically exhausted, they're emotionally exhausted, and in the fourth watch, towards the end of the fourth watch, the sun begins to rise above the horizon. And so now, with the sun rising, with the storm serving as a backdrop, they begin to see a figure coming towards them. And it says that when the disciples saw him, being Jesus, but they're not sure who him is yet, walking on the sea, they were terrified. Terrified, they are screaming, right? It's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. So here are a group of physically, emotionally exhausted people pushing and straining in the oars, trying to get a boat to the other side And they haven't slept for 24 hours. Now, I think one of the things that we forget when we read this is that Matthew is experiencing all of this. This has happened. And Matthew's trying to capture for us what it was like. And so he's letting us know that they're crying out, it's a ghost, and they're crying out in fear. And this idea that they're saying it's a ghost is that they really actually believe they're going to die. This isn't a group of men who've been Um, kind of ah, like they're on some uh, kind of thrill ride or amusement park or going through the Indiana Jones ride and there's something that jumps out at them. They are terrified to the point that they think they're not going to make it to the other side. And when you're in that kind of mindset, when you're in that kind of place, you do things a little irrationally. So in 2019, there was a story circulating on the internet where a mother, um, while she was getting ready to go to bed, looked on her video monitor and she saw this. Now, this grainy picture of the video monitor, she, as she squinted, began to make out a face right beside her son who was sleeping. As she stared at that face, she began to see that there was actually a, an entire outline And she became convinced that there was a ghost in the room with her baby in the crib. And so what does she do? She barely sleeps at night because she's staring the entire night at the monitor, making sure that the ghost doesn't do anything to her baby. Now, when I remember seeing this story, my first thought was, woman, Why didn't you go get the baby? Like, 
why did you stare at the monitor with the baby go snuggling with your baby? Like, what are you thinking? Run in. You just run in. You kick that ghost baby in the face. You yank up your child and you say, not today, devil, not today. And you run right out of that room. You don't stare on a screen making sure the ghost baby doesn't do anything. You rescue your child. But why? Because she's having this extreme emotional fear reaction, right? It's that fight or flight or that freeze or fold response. We're not very prone to making very thoughtful decisions in that adrenaline surge, terrified kind of place that the disciples found themselves. The next morning, after she allowed the ghost baby to snuggle with her ghost, with her actual baby, the entire night, she went in, got her baby, and realized that actually what had happened was underneath the sheet, the, <laughs> the sticker for the mattress had been left on, and so that baby's face was coming through. So in the morning, it's all funny, and it's hilarious, and it becomes this viral meme that spreads around, and everybody's laughing. Um, but in the moment, it was terrifying. In the moment, fear had gripped them. See, in the moment, the disciples were convinced they were going to die. And so what do they do? They scream, they yell, but it says, but immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. And here's what's really important, and I don't want to skip over this, because if we're going to be people who learn how to be brave, if we're going to break out of prison of fear, then it starts with recognizing that courage is not an emotion, right? If I had walked into that lady's house or showed up at that man's apartment with the police, and I had merely said, be courageous, and, and they're thinking courage is an emotion, then they wouldn't have been able to do it. You can't command an emotion. Jesus actually, with Matthew's very explicit kind of verbatim capture of his words, Jesus in the language of the day is actually commanding courage. You can't command an emotion. It doesn't work in parenting. It doesn't work in relationships, right? Emotions are things that happen as a reaction to something. And so Jesus, when he says, take courage to a group of men who are in hysterics, he is not calling them to feel something. He is calling them to decide something. And this is a really important step if we're going to be people who take steps out of the prison of fear and move towards bravery, is to recognize that courage is a choice you and I make. You didn't choose the circumstance, you didn't choose the fear, but you can choose courage courage in the midst of the fear and the circumstance. And this is why Jesus could say to them, take courage. You see, courage is a choice we make in spite of the circumstances, not a feeling we have in our circumstances. And what plays out in this very simple verse that we just read, this take courage, it is I, this context around it that Matthew is so beautifully set up for us is not just a reminder that we can choose courage, but he actually, in those very simple words, tells us how to be brave too. The first thing that can be lost in the midst of this context plays out at the very beginning of the passage we read when it says, immediately. You see, this has happened, this whole moment on the sea has happened directly after this incredible moment that happened before it. Immediately preceding was the only other miracle in, in all of the New Testament biographical accounts of the life of Jesus that's recorded in all four books besides the resurrection. So there's only two miracles. This is a potential Jeopardy answer right here. So you're welcome in advance. Only two miracles are found in all four books. The resurrection being the the defining moment of Christianity, the one, the event that all of our hope is placed in. The other one is the feeding of the 5,000. That's the only other miracle that's recorded in all four. Because it's a very profound miracle, one that we can lose sight of with the distance of living in a day with Grubhub and Instacart and Walmart pickup and kind of groceries being delivered. But in this day, there wasn't pantries, there weren't grocery stores Famine and starvation was a real thing. 
And on that day, 5,000 men, because Matthew tells us there's 5,000 men, which means really 5,000 households, show up to hear Jesus speak, and he feeds them with a boy's lunchbox with a fish sandwich inside of it. It's an incredible miracle. And so to, to, to fully understand the scope, imagine you had a tuna fish can, like you would pick up at a grocery store. It would have taken to feed all those people just with tuna fish. If the boy had had a tuna fish and bread, it would have taken 37,500 cans of tuna fish to feed that many people. If you had stacked those tuna fish cans on top of each other, they would be 3,906 feet tall. That's how tall, that's how much fish Jesus miraculously materialized that day. If you were to stack them up to give you a baseline, the Empire State Building, right? You would need three Empire State Buildings to match the size of the stack of tuna fish cans. I mean, a mind-blowing, extraordinary miracle. But the detail that's really important to know coming into this moment is that right after Jesus performs this miracle, as they're getting ready to leave, Right before they leave, Jesus gives them baskets and tells them to go pick up the leftovers. He tells them essentially, hey, grab some carryout before you leave. And so that carryout is placed in the 12 baskets, and each one of them leave carrying a basket of food. They get in the boat, and nine hours later, they're in the middle of a storm absolutely convinced they're going to die. But here's the detail that I think if you'd have been living it, that you would have noticed it after the fact. Imagine 12 guys in a very small boat, straining and pushing, the waves are rocking, the, the wind is blowing, so there's this constant movement. And while you're straining to kind of push the boat forward against the water, you would have had the bumping of these baskets up against your leg, and you would have literally had to push them out of the way as you kept straining with the water. These baskets are constantly bumping up against them as they're rocking and bouncing through the water against this storm. You see, here's what I think had happened. The disciples had forgotten in the darkness of that storm what God had done in the light just nine hours before. The disciples had forgotten the miraculous while they were in the midst of this terrifying moment. The miracles were all around them. The carryout was all over them. Probably at that point, some had even spilled over into the boat. And for you and me, if we're going to be people who want to discover how to step into courage and how to be brave, one of the things that we have to tune our hearts and our eyes to is the recognition of making sure we don't look past what God has done in our past. That the disciples' mistake to forget in the darkness what God had done in the light, the fact that they'd missed that the carry out was meant to carry over into today's struggle, isn't something that they struggled with 2,000 years ago. We can fall into the same trap too. We often look past what God has done in our past. As you imagine this next season on the other side of the pandemic, we have an incredible source of courage all around us because you have made it this far. Think back to last March when the world started just kind of falling apart. Remember how afraid you were? Remember how concerned you were about food and about your family and about your own safety? And now here we are on the other side in another year and God has provided for you. If you look around your room, there is the carry out of God's provision all around you. And that carry out is meant to carry over in today's struggle. And today's fear, the God that was faithful in our past is the same God who is faithful in our present. And one of the great ways that you and I can foster this is with gratitude. Because it's really easy in a fear moment to allow the fear to cause us to start to gripe and complain about what we don't have and what we're lacking. When in reality, we're surrounded by so many 
carryouts of God's provision. And gratitude helps us carry over God's faithfulness in our past and to bring it into our present moment. You see, courage for the present can be found by focusing on God's faithfulness in your past. Or said another way, because I like alliterating, courage for the present can be found by focusing on God's presence in your past. Those gifts of God's grace surrounding you. Those things that oftentimes are the frustrating, the, the kids, the, the job, the car, the house, the clothes. Those things that sometimes are irritations, well, they used to be answers to prayer, not just the frustration. And that one of the ways that we can foster courage is by remembering God's provision, God's presence, the things He has provided for us in our past, and allowing that to come into our present moment to, to help us reform how we see all the things around us. But notice also that when Jesus says take courage, He also says something interesting. He says, it is I, which is a little Yoda-ish, right? But when he says it is I, again, remember, Matthew's the detail. He's the, he's the accountant. He's capturing those words on purpose. And what Matthew is trying to say is he says this phrase to us that for any Jewish man or woman or child, it would have resonated in our ears. He says in the Hebrew, I am. Take courage, I am. This is the same response that God gave Moses when Moses asked him, what's your name? Who do I tell Pharaoh you are? If I'm going to go lead these people out of Egypt, God, against the most powerful army, then you got to help me out. i got to name drop you in a way that sets the stage for what you say you want to do. And God's answer to that question is, I am. And Moses is like, I am. He says, yes, I am that I am. I mean, come on now. I am that I am. I am the what? I'm the creator, the sustainer, the provider. I am the deliverer, the rescuer, the one who parts the Red Seas. I am the one who is the, the justice and the righteousness, the one who has come to set you free. I am that I am. Bam. Ultimate mic drop ever. That's what Jesus is saying as he's walking on the water towards them. And he's saying, choose courage. Why? Because you're surrounded by all of my provision from yesterday. You've seen my miraculous movement in your life. There are literally the baskets all over the boat. But not just that, not just what I've done before, but who I am that I am today. Bam. He's calling them in this terrifying. I've lost my mind. There's a baby ghost in the crib with my child, kind of hysterics. He's calling them to focus on the who, not the what. To focus on the who, because the who that is with you, he says, is greater than the what you're going through, no matter what it is you're going through. The I am that I am. And for the Christians who so easily have memorized the promise that God's presence is present, I think it's worth reevaluating what that means and how that changes everything. Because someone's presence can change the present moment. I was growing up, I had been dating a girl I didn't even um, know was actually cheating on me with another guy. And so neither one of us knew that until he discovered it first. And so one day I'm driving through our town, we're growing up, and I pull over and he pulls up and he's like, you've been dating my girlfriend. And I'm like, dude, I've got a girlfriend. I don't know who you are. And he's like, he says her name. And I'm like, oh, that's, well, that's my girlfriend. You're dating my girlfriend. And he's like, and he's a big guy, right? And he's like, man, I'm going to beat you up, right? and with a little bit more colorful language. And out of nowhere, my brother, who is with me, 
gets out of the car and like walks over and you have to realize so like my brother um my younger brother is a really big dude um could have played college football like his arms were the size of my legs and he walks over to the to the truck this guy is sitting in and he grabs this guy and he just kind of pulls him out of the truck and he says if you mess with him you mess with me do you understand touch him i touch you and then he just kind of like put the dude back in the truck and the guy's face was like no nah, man we're good i'm breaking up with her right and it was just like it was over and you see what i discovered as a teenager is that someone's presence can change the whole present moment. I thought I was going to be beat up. But someone bigger and stronger than me showed up and changed the whole whole circumstance. And for you and I, we have to hear Jesus' call that courage for the present can be found by focusing on God's presence. That God is present with us in this present moment. We may have lost sight of that because of our fear. We may have been blinded to that because of our circumstances in the storm or the uncertainty or the, the what-ifs that are flying through our head and the anxiety that we're feeling. But that doesn't change the reality of God's presence in your present. And what you have to choose to do, remember Jesus said, take courage. You have to choose to focus on the who, not the what. That is how you and I learn how to be brave. But here, I think, is the critical warning for us. So, Wilt Chamberlain is one of the most famous basketball players. One of the, probably the most prolific record holders in all of NBA history. Here he is holding his 100, which is an allusion to his 100-point game, which is this incredible accomplishment. But on top of that, Wilt had six games where he scored 70 or more points, and the rest of the NBA, historically, has only had five of those games. So all the other basketball players in NBA history, five of them, where Wilt has done it six times by himself. He has the most consecutive games without fouling out, over 1,000, and he's the only player to grab over 2,000 rebounds in a season, something he accomplished twice. I mean, he is one of the greats. But yet, if you were to go back into the early 60s, kind of the height of his accomplishments, there was some tension around one part of his game that wasn't nearly as accomplished as this, and it was his free throw. See, Will Chamberlain was a horrible free thrower. His percentage was around 13%. So he barely made one out of the 10 shots that he takes on the free throw line. And while he was so accomplished in all these other areas, it actually kind of fueled people's ridicule of him in this one area. They're like, Will, you're one of the greatest basketball players. Why can't you shoot a free throw? So he actually starts going to see a psychiatrist. He's talking out his feelings because he's having so much insecurity, so much fear, so much ridicule coming from everyone. And so in between 61 and 62, something extraordinary happens. He goes from a 13% free throw percentage to a 61 free throw percentage. Now he's making six out of the 10 shots that he takes. Everybody is blown away. And the reason he was able to do it was because he changed the way he did basketball. This is Wilt standing, getting ready to take the shot. And if you notice his posture, he's actually standing with the ball down low because what takes him from 13 to 61 is Wilt Chamberlain adopts the granny throw, free throw style. And his free throw percentage almost, I mean, it's like a 5x return, right? But then, after 62, a curious thing happens. His free throw line, his free throw percentage, it drops back down to 13. And why? It's because he gets picked on so much about his granny style way of throwing that he never, ever goes back to that style again. He allows the fear to creep back in 
and take control. And he illustrates for us one of the tensions around courage and bravery is that fear is going to always be present in our life as we grow, as we move. Remember, we can't control the fear. We can't control the the inner voices that creep in and seep into our heads. What we can control and what we have to choose daily is courage. Courage to move forward when we don't always have the answers. Courage to maybe step across the line and to confess to someone something that we've done that we've been living in this kind of shadow side of our lives that's been holding us back. Maybe to confession, confess an addiction that we've been secretly nurturing that no one's known about. It takes courage to start to step out and to begin to share and to practice generosity. It takes courage to look at an obstacle and a storm and see a miracle that can happen through it. You see, I think courage is often the thing that precludes, that comes before setbacks becoming setups, when obstacles becoming opportunities, or problems becoming possibilities. It's courage that's the prologue to those kind of storyline shifts. And for you and I to realize that fear is always going to be there. And what we have to do is decide to choose courage. Because courage is what takes the mess and turns it into a message of hope and life for people. That I don't have to know your storyline to know that the part of the storyline you want to see in your life is probably on the other side of you choosing courage. That maybe for some of you today, the biggest courage step you could take is to step across the line of faith and begin to follow Jesus. Maybe for some of you, it's the courage to begin to speak up or to stand up for something that you've been watching happen for far too long. Maybe for some of you, it's to stand up and say, even as an adult, you know what, I'm going to explore a new career path. I'm going to go back to school. Because courage is the prologue to the stories that you and I often want to live. And if you and I are going to be people who move towards courage and bravery, then it's going to happen because of Jesus' presence, His faithfulness, His provision in our past, and His presence in our present. And that because of those things, you and I, no matter who you are, no matter how much of a chicken you've been called your entire life, you and I can take courage. And that is how we can be brave. Let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you for who you are, for what you've done, for the way that you've brought provision and breakthrough in our past. Thank you for a history that is your story of faithfulness. Thank you for the way you provided for us in this last year. Thank you for the way that you, in moments in our lives before, have brought breakthrough where we were convinced it was only going to be breakdown. And I pray today, Father, in, in this very moment, that you would begin to whisper into hearts, take courage. It is I. And that we would be people who would choose courage in spite of the fear, in spite of our circumstances. And that it would be the prologue to the greatest story you can tell through our lives. And it's in your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen.